Uh, hi, uh, I'm Neil Bitansky, and I'll tell you about my work with uh, Tsvika Wakerski on uh, classical binding for quantum commitments. So commitments are one of the most basic cryptographic primitives that are very often used in the design of protocols. And uh, let me remind you what those are exactly. So in commitments, we have a sender and a receiver that interact in two phases. In the first phase, the sender commits to a message M, and in the opening phase, it can open this commitment. And the basic properties we ask are hiding, which means that before the opening phase, the committed message is hidden, and binding, which says that the commitment can only be opened with single message. And these properties could be either computational or statistical, although not at the same time. In this work, we're interested in quantum commitments. Specifically, we're still thinking about committing to classical messages, but the communication and the parties are quantum. And as it turns out, for quantum commitments, the question of binding becomes rather complicated. And in particular, the classical notion of binding is generally considered impossible due to what we call superposition attacks. Specifically, consider, for example, a, a malicious sender uh, who creates a superposition of messages, say zero and one, and execute the honest sender, but in superposition. Then, right before it opens, it measures the message register. And only then it sends the open. So, if the receiver is uh, uh, unitary, then the message bit is not really fixed after the commitment. It is in fact uniformly random. And there does seem to be an easy way out of this. For example, we can just have the receiver measure the entire commitment and thus effectively make the channel classical, make the commitment classical. And, and this indeed works, at least for statistically binding commitments. So what's the catch? So the point is that by forcing the commitment to be classical, we might be missing out on features that can only be achieved quantumly. And one own example where quantum commitments are really superior to classical ones is that they can be constructed non-interactively from one-way functions, that is secure one-way functions. And, and this is not known classically, and in fact, it is subject to black box barriers. However, the corresponding quantum commitments, at least the one that we have now, are at the same time inferior to classical commitments. They satisfy a weaker binding guarantee. In particular, the committed message is not really fixed by the commitment. And this also makes them harder to use and analyze. And the question is whether this price is necessary or perhaps we can have the best of both worlds. So in this work, we essentially show that we can achieve the best of both worlds. So let me tell you about each of our contributions. So we first define classical binding for quantum commitments, which has a similar guarantee to that of classical commitments. And in particular, the commitment fixes the message. Intuitively, this notion can replace classical commitments in applications or protocols without really changing the proof. And we demonstrate this for classical zero-knowledge protocols like GMW. We then show that we can actually achieve a statistically binding version of this notion non-interactively from one with function. So we indeed get the best of both worlds. Finally, we also explore a statistically hiding version of this notion, and we show that is in fact impossible. And in this talk, I will focus on the definition and the construction, which are really our main contributions. So let's start by introducing our definition. And I'm going to focus on the non-interactive setting although the notion itself also makes sense for interactive commitments. And the basic idea behind the definition is as follows. So we saw that if the receiver makes no measurements, 
then a superposition attack is unavoidable. On the other hand, we said that we don't want to measure everything and make the commitment entirely classical. So the natural thing is perhaps to allow for a partial measurement. And the goal is that on one hand, it will suffice for fixing the message. And on the other hand, it will leave the commitment sufficiently quantum to achieve superior features, those superior features that we're after. Okay, so now I'll go into the definition step-by-step step, and I'll start from the syntax of the commitment. So here the sender takes as input a classical message M and perhaps some ancilla, and it outputs a quantum commitment C together with a possibly quantum decommitment D. The receiver is then going to apply some unitary and measure part of the result. Okay, and this will result in some classical string called R. And also a residual quantum state that we're going to call Q. Now let us talk about the opening phase. Here we have a verifier which is a quantum algorithm that takes the message M, the decommitment state, and the quantum receiver state Q, as well as the classical measurement R. And if everything was done honestly, then the verifier is going to accept. Okay, so this is the, the syntax, and now we'd like to discuss the security requirements namely hiding and binding. And actually computational binding is defined here in the standard way, analogously to uh, classical commitments. So I'm going to focus on our notion of classical binding. So here we're going to consider the following experiment. In the commitment phase, we're given an adversarially chosen quantum commitment called C star which is perhaps created with some entangled state, let's call it S star, which the sender keeps for itself. Then the receiver is applied, making its partial measurement R and keeps the residual quantum state Q. Now, what happens in the opening phase is the following. So we have an unbounded quantum equivocator, okay? And this quantum equivocator gets those quantum registers that were originally kept by the malicious sender and were generated together with the commitment. And we also going to allow it to get the result of the receiver's measurement, okay? This only strengthens the, the definition. Um, it also makes sense uh, without it. Um, in any case, the equivocator then generates a message M star together with decommitment information in this star, intuitively with the goal of breaking whatever binding was created in the commitment. So what's exactly the, the guarantee here? So the commitment should guarantee that the equivocator basically fails. And specifically, we want the measurement R to fix a single message M, which is only a function of R, of the classical string R, the result of the measurement. So that any opening to a different message, M star, is going to be rejected by the verifier with overwhelming probability. So in this sense, it is classically binding. There's a single message fixed by the commitment and it is impossible to later divert from it. So this is the definition and we think it's quite natural. And in fact, let me mention that a somewhat similar notion is considered by Bartusek et al. Uh, they don't talk about constructing it, but rather applying it. Specifically, they show that it can be used, for example, in the construction of malicious oblivious transfer from one way functions. Okay. Okay, so now I would like to tell you uh, a little bit about our about our construction uh, that achieves the notion of classical binding non-interactively from one-way functions. Okay, so the starting point is Naor's classical commitments from one-way functions, which have two messages. We're not 
not interactive. And let me remind you what those are. So here the receiver starts from sending a free end bit random string to the sender, I'll call it X. And the sender is now going to commit to its B2B -B as follows. It's going to use a pseudo random generator that expands n bits to free n bits. It will sample a random seed for this generator called S and send the corresponding PRG image, G of S. And it's going to sort it with the receiver message X or not according to the B2B, okay? So if the B2B is one, it's going to XOR the receiver's message X. And if it's zero, it's not going to do uh, anything, it's not going to XOR uh, anything. And this is the, the commit method. And the opening is simply the, the B2B and the seed S, okay? And this really allows to verify the structure of the commitment. This is what uh, the verifier will do. Um, okay, so, this commitment, uh, it's easy to see that uh, it's hiding uh, because commitments are always pseudorandom, regardless of the B2B. Um, and it is also binding as long as the receiver's message X satisfies a certain property, specifically it shouldn't be the XOR of any two PRG images. And by the way, we chose our parameters, PRG is sufficiently expanding its image is very sparse. So this is only going to happen with negligible probability. Okay. So let's move to our quantum commitment. And the basic idea is to use the fact that it is quantum to sort of de-randomize the receiver message X. So specifically, we're going to do the following. So we're going to have the sender create a uniform superposition over all string X, all receiver string X, and compute the corresponding neural commitment in superposition for each one of them. And indeed, if the sender acted honestly, then measuring the state is going to result in a random receiver message X and a proper neural commitment. And the hope is that using our quantum power, we can also check that the sender indeed generates a proper state. So there are a few steps we need to make for this idea to work. So let's see what those are. So first of all, notice that as is, this commitment that we created is not really hiding. And the problem is that, for example, when we commit to zero, then the second register, the, the pseudo random register, it's completely independent from the X register, okay, the intensive product. And in the case that we're committing to one, we're going to be uh, very much entangled. So this will allow us to easily distinguish the two. So we need to do something here. And we're going to change the construction as follows. We basically aim that for each string X, we will use a fresh PRG. State. Okay. And it turns out that using a pairwise independent hash function is in fact sufficient here. Specifically, we use a lemma by, by Zandri that essentially says that the composition of a PRG and a pairwise independent hash is perfectly indistinguishable from a random function given a single quantum query. Okay. And this state that describes our commitment can indeed be generated using a single quantum query with such an work. Okay. The more interesting part is really binding. So what can we claim about that? So for that, we have to address what kind of measurements uh, the receiver makes and how the opening is verified, right? And we make here two basic observations. So first, if we don't measure anything, then given the bit B and the hash function H, we can uncompute the decommitment measure and find out whether it really had the right form or not, or rather whether it was close to having the, the right form. The second thing is that if the commitment did in fact have 
the right form. And we didn't perform this uh, test, but rather measured it directly in the computational basis, then we would simply get a proper NAOR commitment, right? X will be distributed like a random receiver message, and accordingly, we'll get binding. The point, of course, is that we want both of these things at the same time. So let me tell you how we're going to achieve that. So in our final construction, the center's commitment is simply going to be the commitment we just saw, but repeated many times in parallel, independently. Okay, so just a parallel repetition of the commitment that we just saw. And when the receiver gets this commitment, it's going to do the following. It's going to flip a random bit for each one of the copies and decide whether it's going to measure it in the computational basis uh, or not measure it at all, just keep the corresponding state. And the decommitment then consists of the bit and all the hashes from all the, the copies. And we need to say, how does verification look like? So here we're going to test that all the unmeasured commitment really have the correct, the correct structure, and you're going to uncompute and, uh, and measure. And uh, um, for the measure commitments, we're simply going to verify them as we would verify Naor's commitments. Okay. And what's going on here intuitively is that the correctness test for a random subset of these commitments essentially ensures that many more commitments were properly structured. And having measured them, the overbinding would kick in. Okay. So formalizing this, of course, require, requires cares because uh, uh, in an adversarial commitment, all of these parallel commitments are really going to be entangled and we don't know exactly how. And the way we formally prove this is by a reduction to quantum interactive proofs and where we can uh, basically invoke a general parallel repetition theorem for quantum interactive proofs by Kitaev and Walters. Okay, so this is the commitment. Uh, the last thing I want to note about it is that in fact, the commitment itself is perhaps quantum, but the decommitment is completely classical. And this is uh, another advantage that this commitment has over previous quantum commitments. Okay, so let me summarize. Um, so quantum commitments can be uh, as binding as classical ones, okay? But at the same time, also superior. And specifically, we show that they can be obtained non-interactively from one way functions. And one great question is, of course, which other interesting features can such quantum commitments uh, have? Um, and perhaps another interesting question is whether we can apply similar ideas, for example, such de-randomization for other primitives, or perhaps in totally different settings, maybe in complexity theoretic settings. Okay, so this is it uh, for this time. Uh, thank you for listening.